This fourth video concerning impossible things is going to crank it up a notch and show you that neither space nor time exist as you know them. There are no complicated equations, there is no complicated mathematics, just a simple deconstruction of everything you think that you know. As you sit watching this video, you are stationary within the three space dimensions, but time passes by and so you move within the time dimension. Of course, to say that you are stationary within the three space dimensions is not entirely correct, so I hope you are holding on to your seat. Now you will hopefully have realized that your motion through three-dimensional space is relative as you fly through the universe at well over a million miles an hour and away from parts of it faster than the speed of light, you do not sense it because you experience your motion relative to the Earth. The Earth is your inertial frame of reference. The more perceptive amongst you will have noticed me slip into key terms. So let me explore them and bring in Galileo, Isaac, James and Albert to help me. Galileo stated that on a ship traveling at constant speed on a smooth sea, someone doing experiments below deck would not be able to tell whether the ship was moving or stationary, or to put it another way, that the laws of motion are the same in all inertial frames. This is the theory of relativity, Galileo style. Isaac Newton stated that an object at rest will remain at rest unless you give it a shove, and an object in motion continues in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless something acts on it. This is often called the law of inertia. So if you are stationary or moving at a constant velocity, you are in an inertial frame of reference. James Clerk Maxwell stated that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. And this led to the calculation of the speed of light. Albert Einstein stated two things. The laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference and the speed of light is constant in all inertial frames of reference. It's the consequence of these two simple statements which changed the world. And now I'm going to talk about relativity, but it shouldn't be hard. For instance, do you know what this is? Good, then you have no excuse for panicking over this next bit. Here is your brand new laser clock from eBay. A beam of light bounces between two mirrors, ticking off the seconds as it does so. It is super accurate. You are so proud of your new clock that you jump on a super fast train to take it to show your mother. As you thunder across country at a constant speed on the railway's new near light speed train, your clock behaves precisely as Galileo, Newton, Maxwell and Einstein all agreed it should. And so your new clock keeps perfect time as you would expect it to. Now, I am standing on a railway platform as your super high-speed train flashes past. I have very keen eyes and I notice that your clock appears to be running slow. So I text you on the train and tell you the same. You text me back and tell me I'm just jealous because I don't have a super duper laser clock like you. Now, why would I think your clock was running slow when to you it was keeping perfect time? Because of this. As your train passes, I see your clock and I see the light pulse at the bottom of the clock, just as you do. I watch the pulse as it bounces between the mirrors, just as you do. But in my frame of reference, the mirrors move from left to right along with the train, so that when the light pulse reaches the top mirror, the train and mirrors have moved, and they have moved again by the time the light pulse returns to the bottom mirror. So what? Well, it should be obvious that for me, the light pulse has traveled further. That is, when observed from my frame of reference, the light pulse travels further than it does when observed from your frame of reference. We both agree that the speed of light is a constant. So if I see the light pulse travel further, it must take longer to get there. So what? Well, we know that distance equals speed times time and speed for light is C. So if we call the distance the light travelled from the train frame of reference CT0 and the distance that the light travelled from the platform frame of reference CT1 and add the speed that your train is travelling as a proportion of the speed of light and call that V, 
we get a triangle. So let's ask Pythagoras, and this is as hard as the maths will get. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Now we need to know what t1 is, i.e. what time elapses from my frame of reference when a second elapses for you. And we thus solve this equation for t1, which I'm not going to bore you with. It's on the screen and in the references if you want to play. But what this equation tells us is that, observed from the platform frame of reference, time on the train appears to be moving more slowly. And how much more slowly is dependent on v, i.e. the speed of the train as a fraction of the speed of light. Now if v is very small, as it is for us day to day, then v squared over c squared is nearly zero, and t1 equals t0, i.e. there is no noticeable time dilation. This formula is the Lorentz factor, named after a clever Dutch bloke, and is used throughout relativistic calculations. I do hope that was clear. Now for a head spinner, though I hope to de-spin your head very quickly. Everything I have just described to you was me viewing your clock on the train from my frame of reference on the platform, and to me it appeared that your clock was running slowly. But what if we swapped things around? I'm still sat on the platform, but now I have the clock. Now we look at things from your point of view on the train. What do you see from your train frame of reference? Well, I hope you'll understand that you see exactly what I saw. The path that you see the light pulse on the clock take will be longer from your frame of reference than it will from mine sat at the platform. That is to say that you on the train will think my clock is running slow. You will think time is running more slowly for me. How can that be? How can I on the platform think that time is running more slowly on the train, whilst you on the train think that time is running more slowly on the platform? Which of us is correct? The answer is we both are, because all measurements are relative, and the issue will be reconciled when we are both in the same frame of reference once more. I, on the platform, am in the Earth's frame of reference. Unless you stay on the train forever, you will return to the Earth's frame of reference, at which point we could compare time and would discover that time had indeed slowed down for you. If that is not clear, then this may help. As well as time dilation, you on the train will experience length contraction. Remember that we can measure length in light years, the distance light travels in a year. We could also measure it in light minutes or light seconds. Now imagine that as you are travelling on the train, every second you spray a tiny spot of paint onto the train track. How far apart are the spots of paint? Well, you will argue that they are a light second apart. But when I go onto the track to measure them, the train track is in my frame of reference, and from my frame of reference, the seconds on the train are further apart, and so I will measure the spots of paint on the train track as being further apart than a light second. How much further will depend again on the Lorentz factor. This hopefully shows you both the relativism of time and that at relativistic speeds, length contraction occurs. Let me concentrate again on time dilation for a moment. How does increasing speed affect time dilation? Let's imagine your train could travel at one-tenth of the speed of light. At one-tenth of the speed of light, v is 0.1, v squared is 0.01. 1 minus v squared is 0.9, the square root of that is 0.995, and therefore one second on the train appears to take 1.005 seconds when observed from the platform reference frame. If we get up to half the speed of light, one second on the train appears to take 1.155 seconds when observed from the platform reference frame. If we get up to 0.866 of the speed of light on the train, then one second on the train appears to take two seconds when observed from the platform reference frame. So the faster the speed on the train, the more time dilates. For you on the train, everything is normal, because it's not just your clock which slows relative to me on the platform, it is everything, your breathing, your heartbeat, your brain neurons, the electrons inside the atoms which make up every chemical in your body, 
time really is running more slowly for you compared to my frame of reference. Now all of this sounds wonderful if you have a T-fal head or love maths, but what about the real world? Well, there are two real world instances of relativity which should convince anyone that this is more than geek maths. The first is GPS. To accurately get your car to where you want it requires precise time and distance measurements. GPS satellites orbit the Earth at approximately 8,700 miles per hour, and so they are in motion relative to your car. Because of this, the clocks on GPS satellites appear to run slow when compared to the clock in your car's GPS unit. If relativity was not taken into account, the GPS system would drift by about 10 kilometers per day and be completely useless. The second slightly more scientific application concerns muons. Muons are subatomic particles produced in the Earth's upper atmosphere when extremely high energy cosmic rays, protons, smash into atoms. The cosmic rays are traveling at near light speed and the muons they produce do likewise but muons decay into other particles in about two microseconds. Now, light travels at a speed of one foot per nanosecond, so a muon should only travel 2,000 feet after its creation before it decays. But in fact, muons reach the Earth and are detected in facilities seven, 800 yards underground. How come? Well, from our frame of reference, the muon experiences time dilation. And from the muon's frame of reference, well, its lifetime is not affected, but it sees length contraction due to relativity, again by the Lorentz factor, and thus it does not have so far to travel to reach the Earth. Now let us look at this graph. You will notice that the curve is asymptotic. It tends towards one, but never quite gets there. And this graph is applicable to time dilation, length contraction, but also mass, because Einstein's E equals mc squared is also subject to the Lorentz factor. And it's for this reason that no object with mass can reach the speed of light. Because as you approach the speed of light, the energy required to move the mass approaches infinity. So nothing can actually travel at the speed of light. Except, of course, light. Light travels at the speed of light. The light arriving at the Hubble Space Telescope from galaxies 13 billion light years away started traveling towards us a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. But here's the thing. When a photon of light was emitted from a star in that far distant galaxy, that photon traveled at light speed. If the photon was carrying a clock, one second on the photon's clock would appear to take a literal eternity from the Earth's reference frame. Immediately the photon was emitted by the star, it arrived at the detectors on Hubble. But how far did it travel? Well, the photon might think it has traveled no distance at all because of infinite length contraction. The photon would see the distance between the star and the Hubble detector contracted to zero. When the photon was emitted from that far distant star, it traveled zero distance in zero time to arrive at the receptors on the Hubble Space Telescope. Is that impossible or just relatively impossible? And what about you? You've been watching this video by receiving photons emitted by the screen traveling at light speed to your retina. So how far away is that screen of yours and how much time has really passed? If you like this video, please thumb it up. If you're not subscribed, one click will do it. And as always, thank you for watching.